morning. Jean. Yeah, sure. sure. So, so Jean's, Jean's question, question is just, just to explain to... the difference between that stanza that we just sang in Charles Wesley's hymn. He breaks the power. So in the alternate version, the updated version, he breaks the power of reigning sin. Oh, wait a second. So originally Charles Wesley had written, he breaks the power of canceled sin. I actually think that should have been the preferred reading, but anyways, um, I lost that vote on the Psalter Hymnal Committee. Um, anyways, I think it's because the OPC Trinity Hymnal had the words reigning sin and the URC Blue Hymnal had canceled sin. So we did a rock, paper, scissors, and I think we lost. Um, to your point, the difference is both are accurate, but when we are justified, it could be said, using the word cancel, that the Lord has canceled our sin. You know, it's the word that is used in Galatians. He's canceled the record of debt that was against us. So in justification, the sin is canceled. It's expiated, but it's still indwelling. So Charles Wesley is saying that canceled sin, that sin that's been canceled, is still in our hearts. And Christ breaks the power of that canceled sin so that we can resist it and we can grow in grace. And I think the, and it wasn't, I doubt it was the OPC that modernized or changed the word from canceled to reigning, but they thought really what Wesley's thinking about is the sin that still reigns within us. So they went with that word instead. But I think the word canceled sin, it's, yeah, you can sing it and not really realize what's being sung there, but I think Wesley's point was correct is that justification cancels sin, but the sin still with, indwells us and that power is broken. So, good question. Any other questions? All right. We have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of our souls. It's always good to just remember that our salvation is in a person, Jesus himself. We're going to study the sacraments. We have studied for a number of weeks the church, the order of the church, the officers of the church, the ordering of the church, the governing of the church. We transition in the Belgian Confession to think now about the sacraments of the church. Let's, uh, let's begin with the Belgian Confession and then we'll go to the scripture. Turn it to page 189 in the small booklets. Article 33, page 189, The Sacraments. This is in the Belgic Confession. Please follow along. We believe that our good God, mindful of our crudeness and weakness, has ordained sacraments for us to seal his promises in us, to pledge his goodwill and grace toward us, and also to nourish and sustain our faith. He has added these to the word of the gospel to represent better to our external senses both what he enables us to understand by his word and what he does inwardly in our hearts, confirming in us the salvation he imparts to us. For they are visible signs and seals of something internal and invisible, by means of which God works in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. So they are not empty and hollow signs to fool and deceive us, for their truth is Jesus Christ, without whom they would be nothing. Moreover, we are satisfied with the number of sacraments that Christ, our Master, has ordained for us. There are only two, the sacrament of baptism and the Holy Supper of Jesus Christ. So we're going to see how far we get today. And we're going to first of all turn to some scriptures to read. Turn to Matthew chapter 26. Just setting before you these two sacraments as Jesus instituted them from Matthew's own record, Matthew 26, verse 26 through 29. This is the institution of the Lord's Supper. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, Drink of it, all of you. 
For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Turn just a couple pages ahead to Matthew 28. Jesus gives the Great Commission. Just a little bit of an anecdote, if you remember when we had looked at, uh, I think we had looked at this a while back on the ascension of Christ. This is not given at his ascension. This was given from Galilee. So this is not the moment Jesus ascends. This is the Great Commission. He ascends later on out of Jerusalem, Mount Olivet. But anyways, a little tidbit. Matthew 28, verse 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Beautiful conclusion to Matthew's Gospel. I also point your attention to the note page on the sacraments. A little bit different format than normal, but still some blanks to fill in if you would like to do that. But otherwise, space is given you to take notes. In in Article 29 of the Belgian Confession, we confess that one of the marks of the true church is the pure administration of the sacraments. And that's what we're going to be focusing on in the next three articles. Article 33 today, dealing with the sacraments themselves. Then follow that, an article dealing with baptism, and then an article dealing with the Lord's Supper. So it might take us a few weeks to get through this. <clears throat> I want to begin with some preliminary comments about sacraments. And as we work through this, I'll try to help you fill in the blanks as, we, as they are appropriate. The word sacrament, just some preliminary comments. The word sacrament is like the word trinity in that it is not found in the Bible. The word sacrament is a Latin word, sacramentum, which the early church used to translate a Greek word, mysterion. So if you listen, you can hear the word mystery in that. So the Latins said that they saw, okay, what, this is what you do in translation. So you've got this foreign language, and you say, okay, what la- word in our language most closely will, will copy that idea? The Greek word mystery, mysterion, is the one to which the Latin said sacramentum will suffice as a, as a parallel word. And this is actually a very interesting comparison. It was a fitting choice. Interestingly, the word sacramentum was not the original word used to refer to the sacraments, but one that the Latins employed. There is something to be gleaned by this translation, mysterion, with sacramentum. Paul, for instance, in 1 Timothy 3.16 says the following, Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery we confess, the mysterium which we confess that he was manifest in the flesh, speaking about the incarnation. So remember some of preacher Galatians years ago, but in the Greek Christian uh, mindset, the word mystery was referred to not something that we didn't know the answer to, but mystery referred to something that had been hidden, but now revealed, now disclosed. And so Paul is saying to Timothy, here's a mystery. Everybody looks at Jesus, but only those who have faith see that he is the Son of God. That truth is revealed to them. So Jesus is a real mystery Something concealed, but now revealed. He's not merely a man, but he is the Son of Man, Son of God. So, that's the word mystery. It refers to things hidden that cannot be known unless God reveals them. Now, sacraments do that, right? Somebody walking in the door from off the street is going to see bread and wine and think, oh, they're having lunch. They see just some physical elements, and they don't know that it is a mystery it has another meaning. Baptism is the same. They see, wow, there's some spiritual thing going on, but we don't know what. It's a mystery. There's a truth contained in it that is revealed to those who believe. And so you can see why they use the word sacramentum. 
to fill that, the word sacramentum was chosen to refer to baptism and chosen to refer to the Lord's Supper uh, because of the way this Latin word had been used. It was used by the Latins to refer to something that is sacred. So that was the, that was the spiritual use of the word, refers to things that were sacred. But in the secular use, sacramentum was used to refer to a deposit, to a guarantee or an oath. The sacramentum was the oath that a Roman soldier took swearing his loyalty to his commander, the sacramentum. And so the Latins said, here is a sacramentum, something sacred, something that uh, reveals truth, but also an oath. In the sacraments, God is swearing an oath to us, his children. And so we're going to use this word that has been handed down to us by the Latins, sacramentum, as uh, an equivalent to mysterion, truth that is revealed. The Belgic says that we believe that our good God, mindful of our crudeness, how do you like that, and weakness, has ordained sacraments for us. The point that it's making is that God gave us these sacraments because we are weak, because we are corporal, we're fleshly creatures, and they're given to give us additional encouragement Sacraments are gospel, produ gospel presented to our external senses. You see something, feel something, taste something, touch something. It is the gospel made visible, presented to our senses. Even though Jesus pronounced a beatitude upon those who have not seen and yet have believed in the gospel, he is mindful of the fact that we nevertheless are fleshly creatures who need to see, touch, feel, and taste. And so the sacraments are given to us as aids to our faith. It is God accommodating himself to our creatureliness, including our weakness and our simplicity. So here's just some, some points of application. When the church feels pressured to introduce other physical props for worship, she should remind herself that God has already given her two props for worship, baptism and the Lord's Supper. We must not think that we are wiser than God. Remember last week we were actually talking about that, all the different ways in which ancient Israel committed idolatry, thinking they would just tweak the worship and it never went well. They always got killed. And... You know, here's a contemporary example. Our church worshipped originally in Valley Christian, a church just down the street. And at Easter time, they had a cross made out of nails, all welded together, but yay high. And at some point in the service, all the kids would bring, walk up to the front and put an Easter lily and, and put it in the cross. Wasn't that original? What a great idea. I'm being cynical or satirical. Um, they said, we need something to see. We need something to touch. We want something to smell. We need an encouragement to our faith, something to bolster us. And God said, I've already done that. The Lord's Supper and baptism. We should not be wiser than God. How many sacraments did Jesus Christ give the church? Baptism and the Lord's Supper two sacraments. You can fill in your first two points, number one and number two. He gave us two in there, baptism and the Lord's Supper. The Roman Catholic Church uh, has seven sacraments, and in addition to baptism and the Lord's Supper, which they call Eucharist, Eucharist is the Greek word, Eucharisto, meaning thanksgiving. It's actually a, a beautiful word, and we could use it, the Eucharist. We come and we give thanks as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. But in addition to baptism and the Lord's Supper, they had confirmation, the sacrament of initiation, Reconciliation, the sacrament of penance or confession, uh, the sacrament of extreme unction, anointing the sick, and the sacrament of marriage and ordination or holy orders. We do not believe in the Protestant faith that any one of those five additional sacraments are sacraments. They are introductions and impositions upon the worship of God that must be rejected. It is clear even as we just read that here are two indeed. Christ institutes baptism, and he institutes the Lord's Supper. All right, proceeding. Those are preliminary remarks. Sacramentum, Latin, 
following Greek mysterion, truth revealed. Sacraments are visible signs and seals of the gospel, number three. So we're going to look at what is a sacrament, and then, Lord willing, we'll get further along next week. A sacrament is, even as we see it here on the page 189, visible signs and seals of something internal and invisible. So if you want a little catchy phrase, it's a visible sign of an, in, of an invisible grace. There's a good catechism fifth grade definition. A sacrament is a visible sign of an invisible grace. Similar to a parable, want a definition for a parable? An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. It works. So here we have a visible sign of an invisible grace, or more extensively, a visible sign and seal of something internal and invisible. It is a visible gospel. Augustine, our church father, referred to the sacraments as a visible word. So we could call it this. It is the sacraments are God's flannel graph. So I'm dating myself. The little kids don't know what a flannel graph is, but if you were born in the 70s and 80s and you had Sunday school, you had the flannel graph. And the teacher would put up, you know, Noah's Ark and some animals. And the sacraments are God's flannel graph. God speaking to us at a very simple level, giving us tangible things to see and touch and feel to represent to us the gospel, namely Christ himself. It represents and it seals the gospel to us. In the sacraments, the drama of the covenant is being reenacted before our very eyes. Instead of seeing a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passing between two torn animal halves, we see instead water that is being poured out. Or we see bread that is being broken. We see wine that is being poured into the cup. We see acted before our very eyes a reenactment of the crucifixion of Christ and its benefits. The language that we're using here, sacraments are visible signs and seals, is the language God himself employs when he speaks about sacraments. For example, the sacrament of circumcision in Genesis 17. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. So when we speak of sacraments, baptism, and Lord's Supper, we define them as signs and seals. That's not language we invent. That's God's choice of words. Circumcision was a sign of the covenant. Paul picks it up in Romans 4.11. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. Romans 4.11. Circumcision, Paul says, is a sign and a seal of the righteousness that occurs through faith. The rainbow was a sacrament. Listen to these clips of verses from Genesis 9, 11 through 17. Listen carefully. See what your ears pick up. This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Though these words are not specifically used, um, the words uh, seal, for example, it is apparent that God uses the rainbow in a sacramental fashion. He uses it to signify and seal a promise and a covenant that he made with the world. And that promise was, namely, that he would never again flood the world in judgment. Other sacraments, the manna that Israel ate in the desert and the rock that Moses struck functioned like sacraments. Again, we remember the word sacrament is not even found in the Bible. So we're taking a concept and we're saying, okay, what fits that? What are signs and seals of the covenant of God's pledge of fidelity to his people and we see the manna and the rock also function in the same way. We read it in Sunday school classes, and we think it's just a story about bread from heaven and water from a rock. And yet, they were outward signs of inward graces, visible signs of an invisible grace. If you think I'm stretching it, listen to what Paul says as he translates the event. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 
all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they all drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. A visible sign of an invisible grace. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10 that Moses struck the rock and the people drank Christ. That's what he says. They drank Christ. Moses says, I give you bread from heaven. And Paul says they ate spiritual food for their souls. And they drank spiritual drink for their souls. What's so striking about the illustration between the manna and the rock that Moses struck is how Paul equates this with baptism, a New Testament sacrament. In the verse before 1 Corinthians 10, verse 3, which I was quoting in verse 2, he says that all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So Paul is thinking and speaking and feeling sacramentally, saying that in the Old Testament, they ate the sacrament of the manna and they drank the sacrament of the rock that was split. And they were all sacramentally baptized into Moses in the Red Sea. The Red Sea in Moses passing through was a sacrament, a visible sign of an invisible grace, of exodus from the land of bondage and entrance into the place of freedom, of walking between the walls of God's judgment that would crash upon the Egyptians, but to them were walls of freedom. Passing through the Red Sea was Israel's baptism. The point is this, that with a sacrament, God signifies and seals his covenant of grace to his people. He is saying truth and swearing it. And he's representing this truth with a sign and a seal. Again, the words that Paul uses in Romans 4, Moses uses in Genesis 17, God uses in Genesis chapter 9. What is a sign? A sign points to something. It doesn't say this is it. It points away from it to something else. Sign saying Twin Falls 80 miles is not Twin Falls. It's pointing ahead saying Twin Falls is 80 miles up the road. A wedding ring is a sign. It says marriage, married. A sign signifies something. It says something. It's pointing to something. A seal authorizes something. It guarantees it. It's like a wax seal on an envelope. The king's seal in red wax. We don't do that today, do we? But what we do do, we have notaries, and they seal documents, and they push their stamp upon it, and it's, the emblem is raised. And this is God's notary Baptism and the Lord's Supper is God's notary upon our faith, swearing that it is real and everything that he has said in it is true and will fulfill, be fulfilled. A sacrament signifies and seals the gospel. It signifies and seals Christ to us with God's grace and God's promise, even as the Belgic here says that what is represented to us is their truth is Jesus Christ. They seal his promises in us. They pledge his goodwill and his grace toward us. Take a step back for a second. Noah has come out of the ark. The world has just been destroyed. And they need to know that God's not going to do that again. They're going to build homes and vineyards, etc., have families. Noah and his descendants needed a sign and a seal that God would never drown the world again in his wrath. And God set a bow in the clouds. It says, here's my sign sealing this oath. I will never drown the world again. Abraham needed a sign and a seal that God would be the God of his offspring, though he didn't have any offspring. Though he waited year after year and decade after decade, 
a seal that he could look to that would get, hold out before him the promise that God would do what God said he would do, that God would raise up from him offspring through whom the nations would be blessed. And so God gave him the seal of circumcision, a sign where God said, Abraham, I am faithful, and I will raise up from you a holy seed. God ratified the covenant he made with Abraham with this sign and seal of circumcision. Christians tend to think of sacraments, whether it be baptism or the Lord's Supper, of something that we are saying to God. We typically think of sacraments as an expression of our faith and our commitment to Christ, when in fact, the opposite is the case. In the sacraments, God is speaking to us. He is the active party. He is saying something to the recipient, just as in the preached word, God is saying something to the recipient. You see, sacraments work in tandem with the preached word. These are the means of grace. In the preached word, God is speaking. You are listening. The sacraments is, we think of the dialogical principle of worship. The sacraments is not you now saying something back to God. The word is the first means of grace, and the sacraments are the supporting means of grace, both of which the Lord is the one who is speaking who is swearing an oath of fidelity, swearing his confirmation of his covenant. But though every covenant has two parties, so we do respond. In a covenant, both parties are saying something to the other party. One is pledging faithfulness and provision and protection, and the vassal is pledging subservience, obedience, taxation, if it would be the case. So there is a case where both parties are doing something but it is proper to see God as the subject and the believer as the object. In a sacrament, God is signifying something and sealing something. We still doubt God's promises, don't we? We still wander like sheep from God's sure paths. We still struggle in difficult times. The sacraments are God's physical sign and seal of his commitment to us in his covenant which he has made with us. It's as if God's word were not enough, as if. He comes to us in the sacraments and says, look, I will show you more grace. In baptism, it is as if God is saying, feel my grace pouring over your filthy head. Be washed in it. In the Lord's Supper, it is as if he says, taste my grace, savor my grace and be nourished with my grace. In the sacraments, the Lord signifies and seals to us the gospel, representing it on God's flannel graph. Here is my truth. Here are my promises. Here is my son. The drama of the crucifixion is reenacted before your eyes in the Lord's Supper. And we partake. Sacraments are added to the word of the gospel. They are confirmatory, they are supportive. They do not teach anything different or give anything extra than what is communicated in the gospel itself. Sacraments, fourthly, I'm just looking at my notes in the time. Sacraments, fourthly, point to something internal and invisible. So we're gonna just kind of dig down deep now on page 189. Visible signs and seals, that's what we were just talking about. Signs and seals something internal and invisible. We believe that sacraments are means of grace. When you partake by faith, when you receive your baptism through faith, you receive grace, real, literal grace. It's important to remember this, that outwardly the sacraments are just mere elements, bread, wine, and water, the common basic necessities of life, but they point to something internal. They point to Christ himself. Just like the sign to Twin Falls points down the road to the city 80 miles down the road, so the Lord's Supper and baptism point the finger at Christ. That is what they are doing. 
And merely possessing the sacrament, just being baptized or eating the Lord's Supper, doesn't necessarily mean that you have received Christ, does it? What does it take to receive the sacrament, or we could say to activate the mystery within it? Faith, and faith alone. Faith is the key, if you will, that activates the gospel within it. Many people saw Jesus die that day, but only those who believed in him received the forgiveness of their sins. And so the internal reality and the invisible grace in the sacraments come to us through the power of the Holy Spirit who brings this grace to us through our believing in Jesus. John Calvin writes the following, Indeed, the believer, when he sees the sacraments with his own eye, does not halt at the physical sign of them, but by those steps rises up in a devout contemplation to those lofty mysteries which lie hidden in the sacraments. So he's saying, in other words, that with the sacraments, they're like steps climbing up the staircase to Christ. You proceed from the things visible to the thing invisible, and you behold Christ in baptism. You behold Christ in the Lord's Supper. So the Belgian Confession says to us, they are not empty or hollow signs to fool and deceive us. They're not, we don't partake of them in a superstitious manner. We partake of them in no other way than by faith. Faith, as the Puritans said, is the mouth of the soul. So we're going to look at baptism here in a, in a couple weeks. Well, next week we'll start at it, Lord willing. Actually, next week Paul Dorman's going to be preaching because they come here Saturday afternoon. But faith is the mouth of the soul. And so you contemplate your baptism. Partake of the Lord's Supper regularly. And it's by faith that you receive Christ. This grace is not communicated automatically. Another distinction from the Roman Catholic Church, they believe that there was a mechanical imposition of grace by merely receiving the sacrament. So if you baptized a baby, it didn't matter whether that baby would ever believe or not believe, his or her original sin was just washed away. So they believed in a mechanical, automatic, immediate reception of grace. The Latin phrase for this is ex oper operato, by the working of the work. The actual work gives grace. Just like you sit down for lunch, you eat food, and the food goes into your stomach, and you are nourished, right? Just mechanical. The Protestants said, no, that's not biblical. Faith is the necessary ingredient. The sacraments do not work automatically, but immediately through the working of faith. And so in response to ex oper operato, the Protestants had their own little jingle, ex oper operantis, by the working of the worker, putting the emphasis upon the believer to receive the water and baptism or the Lord's Supper with faith. It is by faith that grace then is activated or appropriated. Danny Hyde in his book on the Belgian Confession says it like this, without faith, baptism and the Lord's Supper are not signs of grace, but of judgment. They don't lose their strength, but they become covenant curses to us as you partake in unbelief. Because they are signs and seals of the covenant God has pledged with us, we respond to them with faith. Therefore, we partake in a visible covenant renewal ceremony when we partake of the sacraments in faith. We are accepting and embracing God's oath to us. We are acquiescing and submitting to his gospel for us. We are humbly submitting to his truth and responding to his covenant with a commitment to obey him. Sacraments are beautiful things. God's constant reminder, whether it's uh, baptism that you see being done or it's the Lord's Supper that you, are being, you, that you are receiving, God is saying something to you. He's saying, behold my covenant and listen to my promise to be your God, to save you, wash you, forgive you in the blood of my Son. So uh, 
Let me close with this quote from Danny Hyde's book on uh, the Belgic. It just says it very nicely. The sacraments of baptism and the Holy Supper, then, are the physical, tangible elements that Christ has given us as the vehicles of his spiritual blessings. I'll wait one second while the kids come in. If you didn't fill in the blanks, number five is sacraments along with the preaching of the gospel are means of grace. Does the mere reception of a sacrament give you grace? No. What is, the necessar what is necessary in order for you to receive God's grace through the sacraments? Faith. Sola fide. So listen to this, this quote. The sacraments of baptism and the Holy Supper then are the physical, tangible elements that Christ has given us as the vehicles of his spiritual blessings. Our faith is strengthened, not in thunder coming down upon us from heaven, not in fiery angels bringing messages to us, nor in an ethereal way that only a few elite people can understand. Instead, Christ graciously gives common elements to be used in a special way, water, bread, and wine. In doing so, he comes down to our level for the benefits of our faith. They are ordinary means of grace. We should not pretend to be wiser than God and look for extraordinary revelations for the shaking of mountains and thunder and lightning at Mount Sinai. But in the new covenant, the new covenant, which has a fresh, expansive, outpouring measure of the Holy Spirit, all the external props of the old covenant have fallen away and to remain. Bread and wine and water. And God says, here, let this be a lesson to you of Jesus, my son, his death on the cross for you. Praise the Lord. So next week, Lord willing, we'll, two weeks, Lord willing, we'll look at baptism. Let us sing Psalms 23.